This is the Danger Close Podcast, Beyond the Books, with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. The title drop video for my upcoming novel, Only the Dead, is out now on my YouTube channel and social channels, and Only the Dead is available for pre-order now. My guest today, Damian Lewis. He is a former war correspondent turned author and writes primarily about the SAS, Special Air Service, in World War II. Fascinating guy. His book that is out now is called The Flame of Resistance, and SAS Brothers in Arms will be out at the end of October. Now, without further ado, Damian Lewis. There he is, Damian. How are you? How you doing, man? Oh my goodness, I've been so looking forward to this. Thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, no worries. It's always a pleasure to be on your show. Uh, yeah, I love your cave there. That looks uh, amazing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> we wanted to make this a workable room, so it's not just kind of a, a podcast set, but it's actually workable, and I can escape from the house and come out here to write because uh, we have three little kids and uh, everything that goes on with having friends coming over, going all these activities, lacrosse and skiing and snowboarding and all these things that kids do. So it's constant whoa, chaos. And so whoa. trying to write a book, you know, I, I want to ask you about your process because I'm, uh, I'm going to be taking notes uh, professionally <laughs> here because you get so many books out there and you've done so much. It's absolutely incredible. Um, so yeah. I definitely want to touch, uh, you know, ask you about that. But uh, before we get there, um, early life leading up to becoming a war correspondent. How did you, uh, what was that path for you? And I know you have to leave, you have a drop dead time. So I'm going to keep my eye on the clock and make sure I get you out of here right on time. Yeah. Uh, gosh. Um, yeah. <laughs> you're taking me back into a crazy life. I mean, <laughs> I, I was kind of one of those guys who, if everybody else said that job's too dangerous, You'd say give it to Lewis. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to show off. I'm just telling you the truth. Um, so, yeah, I used to go into um, all the kind of um, very dodgy parts of the world you can imagine, uh, often with very dodgy people, or sometimes, and carry out the most crazy, dodgy assignments you can possibly imagine. I can tell you some stories if you want to hear. Them. Yeah, were, were you an independent journalist at this point, or were you uh, working for uh, for a newspaper or a magazine, or did you do both, or what was that like? <laughs> I was most I was mostly TV news, and and to be frank with you, no one would ever have employed me because, uh, you know, I can tell you lots of stories about when I went into war zones with correspondents, like the proper correspondents from the yeah. big stations, and they would do their stand up on the border of the war zone before you crossed it crossed into ground brown territory, yeah. and then and then I maybe with a sound recordist would disappear into that place they weren't allowed to go right. and come back whenever we did with the footage and then they'd put the piece together so um yeah no no one employs people like us um officially or formally because you wouldn't get the insurance and you wouldn't be allowed to go to the places that you want and in fact to be honest with you i i wouldn't have wanted to be yeah. employed because they would have stopped me mm. and i mean i was just always to be really you know to cut to the quick I was always driven to report on what happened to, you know, those caught in the crossfire. And you can only do that if you go to where the crossfire exists. So like today, if I was still doing it, I'd be in Ukraine, but reporting on what the hell that's happening to all those people who were caught in that awful, awful situation. So that's what, you know, really um, drove me. And yeah, uh, one ended up in some really <laughs> crazy situations. Yeah. Crazy. What was what was the draw go, growing up? Did you watch a a movie that featured a war correspondent, or did you read some books, or were you just drawn to tell these stories because of magazine articles you were reading about places uh, around the world? You wanted to explore. What was the uh, what was the draw? Do you know? I don't know. Um, I, I I just can't explain it. But I've always had this kind of affinity for um, people in extremists. Mm -hmm. You know, people pushed into terrible situations, whether it be soldiers through to, um, you know, families caught in, 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 in the worst possible situations you can imagine. I can't explain why. I, I just, I remember one time, okay, so my father uh, 
used to live in the family home, which was an old thatched cottage in Dorset in England, in the middle of the countryside, quintessential okay. chocolate box looking house. And I came back, back from one of these utterly insane assignments. And bear in mind, he would never know where I was or he, probably if I'd gone. Uh, and had absolutely no idea when one would be back. Yeah. And I remember sitting down with him, polishing off a bottle of whiskey. And at some stage, probably three in the morning, he said, do you not understand what you do to us every time you go to one of these places? And I said, well, what else would you have me do? He said, do anything. Sell insurance. I don't care. Just, just can't you stop? And I said, well, there must be something in you in the way you brought us up that made me like this. So is that what you really want? And he kind of thought for a moment and then probably said, I suppose it's it's impossible and it probably isn't what I want. But, you know, I'm torn and, and now I'm a father of four children. Okay. You know, I, I would never in my wildest imaginings wish any of my children to do what I did. Yeah. And in fact, if one of them tried, I'd do everything I could to stop them, especially because for reporters on the front line, it's so much more of a dangerous world. They are now targets. Mm -hmm. I was kidnapped once. OK. In, in, I mean, well, I mean, I, yeah, I was held at gunpoint and lots of other things, but once I was actually kidnapped, but it wasn't a big deal because the people who kidnapped us, it was a bunch of rebels in the Sudan. Well, rebels, they were freedom fighters, call them what you will. And they kidnapped us because the message hadn't got through that we were coming. Okay. And, and, and the guard people I was with were terrified, but I wasn't terrified at all. And I said, look, guys, you know, these are the people I know in your movement. I mean, I knew the head of the, Sudan People's Liberation Army at the time, Dr. John Garang, you know, personally. And I talked talk our way out of it. So it, no one kidnapped you and put you in an orange boiler suit mm -hmm. and chopped your head off on live internet streams right. because that was their cause, not when I was, most of the time I was reporting. So it has just become a much more dangerous world. Yeah. Jeez. How old are your kids? I have a 30-something year old, a 19-year-old, um, a 17-year-old, and a 14-year-old. In fact, my 19-year-old has just literally gone to college. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, last two weeks, he's yeah not been in contact at all. If he's watching this, get in contact. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> Call me. That's right. Yeah. Uh, what? what uh, how did you, uh, when they were a little younger, I, I think as they get older, it might be a little easier to uh, find time where, because uh, they're, Get more freedoms as they get a little older and that sort of thing. So as you're writing and researching and doing all these things and thinking about these, uh, these, uh, even though a lot of these are nonfiction, not all of them, um, but uh, thinking about how you're going to plot these things out or what you want to explore, or what themes you want to drive, either uh, a narrative or what a, a character. Uh, how did you do that? Did you go someplace else, with, uh, uh, physically someplace else, or did the, the kids know not to disturb you when you were in a certain room in the house? Or what did you do to, uh, to have the time <laughs> to write all these things that you've written? So the easy answer is this is my cave. You can see behind me. Yeah. Okay. I am. So we now live in a hundreds of year old, years old, centuries old thatched cottage in rural England. Okay. okay? which was built as two houses, knocked into one, converted into a Wesleyan chapel. Whoa. Okay? And then reconverted back into a house. So <laughs> I am sitting in what was the altar of the chapel. So I write in what was the altar of, of the church, basically. That's where I am now. So the, the rest of the house is, is down that way. And to give you an indication of how it works with my kids, mm -hmm. a few days back, my daughter was told by her school to get three revision textbooks. So in the car on the way home, she said, Mummy, I need to get these textbooks. My wife said, get dad to get them. He's much better at ordering stuff on Amazon. She <laughs> said, no way, I'm not going in there. <laughs> nice. Oh, so you set it up. You set, yeah, you set the stage, set the tone, set the precedent. Ah, oh, smart. Okay. So, so then I, when, when my wife told me, I went and, and found my daughter, who's called Sienna, said, hey, what is this? You scared of me? She said, when you're in there, but damn right I'm scared. Oh, man, I messed up. God. <laughs> That's what you got to do. This is what you got to do. You just got to be a monster. Monster in your cave. When monster you're writing, your you've got to be that monster and, and i'm i'm not i'm not actually joking too much because yeah. well, i get it i don't know about you because i mean i've read your you know your your recent series of books oh, thank you. i mean take my hat off brilliant oh, i love you. the realism i love that scene where he's just got the rifle and he's he's scoping out the vehicle to thank you shoot shoot the bad guy thank you but but 
the point about it is you're in the zone yeah you're there with your characters you're living your characters you're living their narrative and their reality and you know sometimes i get up and i act i act the scenes out i've got you know bows and arrows and boomerangs and and lots and lots of well yeah uh, other things in here which possibly shouldn't have here like very large swords (laughs) and other things and you know sometimes you you actually you're in the zone with your people yep and you can't be disturbed and you know people who yeah people who don't write or don't write in that way Mm -hmm. um don't get it but but i'm sure you i i know you will and that's i'm sure how you do it yeah and you've got to make that space sacrosanct yeah exactly exactly it's tough because you're i mean even when i get up and uh because i go someplace else i have a cabin fairly close by that i can go to and i use um because i get up and even if i go to make a sandwich or i go to pour glass of orange juice or get a coffee uh i'm still think i'm still thinking about those characters yeah. i'm still solving that problem on the page of course you are. and i'm still in it but here if i go to the kitchen and then there are three children wife a babysitter a mother-in-law whatever it might be uh they take you out of it because they oh he's not physically yeah. typing uh yeah. ask these questions or whatever but it's uh it's not efficient <laughs> to do things that way and then come back and try to get into it uh i just love even if I'm getting a snack or even if I just walk outside to look at the view for a second and then come back in, I still haven't left that story. I still haven't of course left you haven't. that. Let, let, let me ask you a question, right? What What is the moment in a day when you get your best, those eureka moments where you think that's what we need to do with the plot or that's what we need to do with the character? Because for everyone who's a writer, there'll be something, there'll be a moment and they'll say, well, it's, it's when I'm doing X and you go, really? No, but that's when it comes to me. What's it with you? A lot of the times it's in the shower because <laughs> yeah, that is one of, one. one of the places where no one's bothering you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So our water bill is extremely high for that reason. <laughs> and I'm just thinking in there and I'll just go into this zone um, because there's not an input. There's not a phone. There's not a computer. And I have a, a separate right. computer that I just write with. And the only reason it's even connected to the Internet is so it can update Word. Uh, but there's yeah. nothing else on there. Um, yeah. So it's, there's no distractions. Phone, I turn that off and not only just turn it off, but I put it in another room. Uh, even yeah. if I'm in that cabin, uh, I put it in another room. Um, yeah. So just I minimize all those types of distractions um, so that those ideas can come to me in places other than the shower. Um, yeah. But uh, but here, typically around here, it's something like that. Um, not, yeah. all, not always, yeah, yeah. but a lot of the time. Yeah. Uh, what about when you're asleep? Not usually because I need more of it. So I right. work late because that's when everyone's asleep. And so I just okay. work until I can't stay awake possibly anymore and then yeah. to bed and then the alarm goes off and I'm up early and, right. and going again. So it's not the most healthy rhythm. Um, this next year is my time to really, um, uh, I guess, maximize efficiencies uh, going into 2023. Now I have uh, someone that can help me out. I have an assistant to kind of take some of the emails and text okay. messages and, yeah. and h- h- figure out, hey, who you owe a blurb to or who asked for one or who you, what foundation asked for signed books and all that stuff. So, yeah. so she can take kind of take care of all that stuff off my plate. Um, yeah. And I have someone here, Austin, over there who is uh, takes care of the technical stuff for the podcast and, and that yeah. sort of a thing. So um, to, to leave me time to write. So that's the, okay. That's, that's nice great. That's so I'd great. hopefully get a little I mean, more sleep and maybe do a couple pull-ups or push-ups and get back because all those things fell to the very bottom of the of uh, priority do. list. That's just how it, yeah, how it yeah, has yeah. to be. Yeah. yeah. But I love it. I love every part of the process. I know some people don't like editing or whatever. I like every single part of the process. I love coming yeah. up with the title. I love coming up with the theme. I love coming up with a one-page executive summary. I love yeah. working on the outline and getting it to a certain stage uh, that then I know, okay, now it's time to turn that into the narrative. And yeah. then I love, okay, now we're getting up to publication and figuring out that date and then uh, working on the marketing and the advertising leading up to that, yeah. and those campaigns. And like, I love every single part of this process. That's you know, fantastic. I mean, if you do, then that, that is the secret to, you know, going stratospheric. Yeah. The, what, the, the, the more you do of it, I bet you, the more you'll wake up with your best ideas. Uh, so what I do is I keep a notebook beside the bed. It really, really, really bugs my wife. Yeah. When the night light goes on, scribbling away what are you doing uh, you just i just got to get it down yeah so yeah sleep, <laughs> sleep is where i get the best ideas and, and and i know other writers like it too and it's actually that you know that in between moment dropping off uh-huh. part in the dream world part in reality yep. those moments are when you get your best best ideas because that's when you kind of tap into the creative subconscious yep. so tip 
Yep, no, I love that. Just in case. And what I, I, I've meant to do to keep the, I've, I've had a notepad next to the bed for a while, but it didn't get used because what I would do would be totally dark. And in that exact moment that you're talking about, right before you fall asleep is where I would get a lot of those. But what I do, yeah. even to this day, is I just throw my legs over the bed and the phone, even though it shouldn't be right there, it's plugged in, but I have to get out of bed to get to it. So I yeah. get out of bed and I send myself an email with the idea okay. before it, because yeah. it lights up, so I'm not looking for a yeah. flashlight or turning on the lights yeah. in the room to write yeah, it down. Yeah, yeah. So I go. just go there to the phone go. and then I send myself yeah. an email and uh, with those ideas. So I do get a lot yeah. of them right there, and I'm glad I do, because the next morning I wake up and I think, I know there was something I wrote down last yeah, night. I can't even remember right. what it was. And then I go to my that's email, right. I'm like, oh, there it is. And uh, so I do have a, a special email that only has those in it. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> too many yeah. emails. If you, don't, <laughs> if you don't get them down at the, at the moment, no. you'll never remember them in the morning. No, they're, they're gone. gone. Yeah. They're gone. Yeah. And no matter how tired yeah. I am, I go, yeah. oh, I wish I could just just I know, keep my eyes closed. Maybe I'll remember <laughs> it in the morning. The couple of times where I've said, <laughs> oh, this is such a great idea. I'll totally remember this in, a, in five <laughs> hours or six hours or whatever it is. Yeah. And then I wake up and I go, what was that? Uh, yeah, well, I'm never going to get it back. And, I, and that drives right. me crazy. So, yeah. so I force myself. Exactly. So that happened a couple of yeah. times. And now I just force myself, throw the legs over, get that phone and then type in the email to myself and then get back in bed. And sometimes it happens multiple times in a row, like three times yeah. in a row, yeah. in the same same yeah. type of a night. I have no idea what differentiates some nights from, from others where none of that happens. But uh, got to get those ideas down and then organize them yeah. and file them in a certain way where you can retrieve them again. Hence the other yeah. email that only has those things. But uh, I'm figuring out the system, <laughs> developing my system, developing the, I have the process, but it's like the system and efficiencies that I need to, need to work on. Um, yeah, good, good, good man. Yeah, but I, but I absolutely love it. And, uh, and do you remember your first time? So, so you're drawn to being a war correspondent. Um, you do that for over a decade before you write your, your first book, before you write Slave? Yeah, two decades, really. Two yeah. decades before you write that mm. book. Um, do you remember yeah. your first time, your first conflict zone? And uh, and what what that felt like to to go into it was that Africa, Middle East. Where, where no, was it wasn't Africa. It was um, so. What happened was um, again, it's a crazy story. Just bear with me. So, I used to be a massive motorbiker, Ooh. and um, so I, I I had a collision with a very large truck, oh. which wasn't my fault when I was twenty one. And um, yeah, uh, very lucky to be alive. I mean, very, very fortunate to be alive in hospital for three months. Oh. Anyway, the point being, I came out of that and, and was paid compensation. And I was 22, 23 at the time, 22, I think. And I thought, okay, let's, uh, most people would have thought, going to buy a house or going to buy myself that dream car. I thought, no, what we'll do is we'll get on a plane, we'll fly to Thailand, we'll cross the border into Burma illegally. Wow. We'll link up with the Karen rebels who are fighting the Burmese military hunter. <laughs> And we'll get them to take us into the across the front line into the brown zone, the contestant territory, and we'll make a film, which is exactly what we did. Wow. So I, uh, myself, and a, a sound recorder guy that I managed to find who spoke the local language, Karen, uh, we we did that for pretty much a year. Lived with um, the Karen rebels in the Burmese jungle, and um, yeah, had some you know utterly unbelievable times. You know, highs and lows, and experiences that you could never ever ever imagine replicating anywhere else you know what it's like when you're in these situations you build these incredible relationships you know the, the experiences are so intense um but yeah back to your question i can remember the first time that well several times we came uh, I, I, one time we were we were with a hundred um karen you can call them rebels you can call them freedom fighters i prefer to call them creed fighters that's what they were doing um and the Burmese hunter sent in a hundred, sorry, a thousand uh, troops of, uh, you know, to to find us because they knew that there was this film crew there, and um, yeah, we were rather outnumbered and surrounded. <laughs> anyway, there was this moment when the commander, with, there was 10, 10, 10 soldiers with me and my sound course. So the commander was a guy called Commander Nixon, named after President Nixon in oh. the states, and he said, um, "Yeah, we have to move." And this was this was like dawn in the jungle. We have to move and we're going to go down the slope across the river. We think the enemy are in the village across the river. If they are, it's not very good news, but that's the only way we can go. So I remember going down that slope uh, in the jungle to cross the river, which was obviously open, thinking, well, if they're there, we're dead. Um, and it's a strange thing. I don't know what your experience was. That was my first real time thinking, we're probably not going to, we might not get through this. Okay. And I just remember thinking, well, if that happens, so be it. And let's just keep the camera running. 
because you never know someone might find it and at least the the story will get out there it's a really strange thing i was so calm i, I can't even explain it and because i you know one imagines facing that moment and you know panicking or i or you know, being petrified frozen with fear quite 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 the opposite and i'm not saying i'm a brave person i don't think i am i just think the the professionalism or the mission you know took over it was it was it was and we had any number of similar um yeah experiences during that year um and then then we came back and made the film and then um went back and did another one no kidding <laughs> which is even more insane <laughs> so that was the first time so yeah. you so you did this film on your own essentially producing it uh yeah, directing it yeah. uh getting it all together funding, it, it, funding, funding it. it yeah <laughs> very important part right there yeah. uh and you came home and you put it all together and then found yeah. a distributor or how did that what happened to, from there once you got, got home yeah all that we, we, we got it picked up by one of the one of the main broadcasters here in the uk so it, it went out and uh yeah i won, won awards and nice. but by then we were back in the jungle because what happened was it's a funny story i'll tell you if you don't mind yeah, yeah. so <laughs> such a funny story <laughs> We we came and said so the, the the rebel base was a place called Manaplor, okay, mm. and a British politician turned up in Manaplor because lots of people were campaigning to try and bring freedom to Burma. Okay, and she learned that there were these two um, uh, um, British journalists way off in in over the front line in in, in Brown contested yeah. territory, and she said, "I don't believe it." And so, she, and because she didn't believe it, she left her card and said, "I challenge you to prove you are who you say you are." So when we got back to the UK, um, I met up with her, and she was a massive campaigner on Burma and freedom. And uh, and then we got this, alleg this allegation came through that the Burmese military hunter had used chemical or biological weapons. Huh. It was kind of in the news, um, and so we went back, uh, myself and the same guy. And before going back, we got the British chemical and biological defense establishment mm. to train us to take samples. Oh, wow. So we went back, filmed the whole journey again, right the way across the front line into the jungle, into the uh. war-torn zone, got to where they'd allegedly used these uh, chemical or biological weapons. It was biological, actually, and then took all the samples, <laughs> brought them back to the UK, and got them analyzed by by our um, chemical and biological defense people um, to kind of, you know, prove, prove, prove the story. Um, and by the time we'd finished doing that, this British politician believed we were who we said we were. <laughs> uh -huh. I bet. I bet. How did you get through customs and stuff like that? Did anyone ask, like, what's in these little man, containers? Man. Or is it just... <laughs> do, you... <laughs> do you look so back another... on it and be like, how oh, do you put it in, like, Ziploc bags? Or what are you, like, how are you keeping this thing from escaping? So... We'd been trained by by the people mm. in the UK to to do it properly, but I then did it a second time in Sudan because there was oh, allegations of, of of chemical weapons use there. This was a few years later, and that time we actually took samples of shrapnel as well. And the point being, even though you you can double lock and triple lock and tape up and seal all this stuff, it was soil, water, of vegetation shrapnel samples. Obviously, shrapnel shows up on a mm. a metal detector. So that was um, that was really um, that was really that was actually very frightening. What was frightening about that was, as we were coming out, we knew the authorities were after us. If that makes sense, because uh -huh. I knew that because the rest, I was there with a couple of you, uh, former American Marines. Okay. They were part of my uh, uh, sampling crew, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. And I went out first with the film footage and the samples because we had a sense that we might get. Um, uh, trouble, and then as they went out through the first African airport that we had to go through on transit back to the UK, they were stopped, stretch searched, interrogated, really not very nicely. Yeah. And then we met up at the next uh, African airport we we're going to fly out of, and I was very, very worried that we were going to get nabbed and yeah. end up, you know, rotting in in a jail there somewhere for the rest of our lives. But but we got out okay. But the funny, the the, the crazy thing was when we put that story out on the BBC. In fact, um, the biggest response that they got from the viewers was how on earth did they manage to get all that stuff through yeah you know right on the plane uh, that was that my was first question. question yeah that was my first yeah. one yeah well you know i mean 
in the in the in the hold of the aircraft. I yeah. mean, oh, geez. it was it was it, this is pre 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 nine eleven yeah. days. Yeah, that was just so things were kind of you know you could do things a bit more <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, easily. Yeah. Uh, did those samples from uh, from both those places end up testing positive for whatever uh, you thought might be in those samples? Yeah. So the first samples of biological weapon. I, I don't know how much you know about. Um, that that kind of warfare, a little bit. it's very very hard to prove mm. because natural um, pathogens occur in the environment anyway. Yeah. So it was it was really difficult to say. Yeah, what what we did retrieve was some of the kind of potential delivery systems. Oh wow! So barometric pre pressure gauges and things yeah. like that, um, trigger switches. Sorry, um, which you'll know about from high altitude free falling. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, but. And then the second time around, we, the, it was degradation products that were found. So the chemical agent degrades in the environment. Okay. So the degradation yeah. products of that of that yeah. uh, substance were found. So in both cases, it was pretty uh, conclusive, as much as you could hope for anyway. Yeah. And the point about it was, you know, I guess we are on the ground, um, you know, we got as quick as you could, obviously, but you were there days, if not, a couple of weeks after the event so the longer it goes on the harder it is to substantiate you know oh, but i thought but i think just the fact that you know there was an investigation by an yeah. independent you know news crew and it was broadcast on the world's media meant that to those regimes both of which were you know horrendous dictatorial um very very unpleasant uh, uh governments one was obviously military dictatorship the other was a was the Islamic fundamentalist military dictatorship. I mean, in both cases, that fired a massive shot across their bows, as you can imagine. It did mean that, you know, they weren't going to get away with this kind of thing with impunity. Jeez. So as you're doing this two decades of running around the world, going into conflict zones, making documentaries, uh, capturing footage, writing stories, um, are you thinking about eventually writing uh, nonfiction works uh, works of fiction are you thinking about or does it or looking back now did making those documentaries and then writing those different stories um help you as far as a uh, being able to tell a story and realizing what uh uh what are the important elements of that if you as you look back yeah i no, i had no desire to write whatsoever um you know i i'm sure you'll relate to this uh, you know you tell me but and it's going to sound like a crazy thing to say to most people but life never feels more real or more special or more precious than when someone has tried to take it away from you and failed mm -hmm. oh, yeah. you've been shot at yeah. or um caught a terrible tropical disease many of which i did catch or you know had someone with a pistol in your ribs and somehow got away with it again mm -hmm. um that's when you feel beat on the pulse of life in your veins like no other. And for that reason, it, it is the most addictive thing on earth. And I was an addict. Oh, wow. I was a war junkie. Absolutely self-confessed. I would never have stopped. I've got any number of pals from the time who are no longer with us because they didn't stop and they ended up, you know, dying in distant parts of the world um, in unpleasant situations. I would never stop. I was forced to stop. So I was forced to stop because I ended up um, having spinal surgery. Oh, wow. So again, um, yeah, um, it's a long story, but I, I shouldn't, you know, I'm extremely fortunate to be alive and extremely, extremely fortunate to still be relatively physically able. Oh, wow. Yeah. So um, I had spinal surgery L1, L2, so middle of the back. Oh. Um, and I had to stop for a year because I was a year in recovery. And during that year, I kind of woke up and I realized that I had been, you know, living this addiction for, t for 20 years. And I thought, yeah, that is going to kill you. Okay. So I stopped. And, and sorry, and during that time, serendipitously, you know, because everything happens for a reason, we like to think. Um, I've been working on a story in Africa, in fact. As, as a TV you know, news report, and a publisher heard about it uh, from a friend of mine at a dinner party in London. And they approached me and said, look, that would make an amazing book. Would you write it as a nonfiction? And I said, well, you know, I, I can't do anything else at the moment because I'm laying up. So that's how I wrote the first book. It was complete 
complete serendipity, complete chance. And, you know, it was a runaway, it was an international bestseller. So yeah. it, it hit some kind of nerve. But no, never, ever had any desire to do so. Jeez. But then going back to your question, what I realized, uh, what I've realized over the years was that, and I really do believe this, if you're going to write about, you know, conflict um, and people in extremists, which I guess is the is the golden thread of what I do, you have to have experienced it, in my view. To bring it home alive and to deliver it on the page, you've really got to have been there. And not only that, you see, because often I write books, you know, which will be telling one or a small group of individual stories. And, and, and often, you know, that will involve spending time with them and very often or, you know, a lot of times it's been with former soldiers. And I can talk to a soldier speaking exactly the same language. Mm, important. Apart from the fact he would have been on the front line with a weapon mm -hmm. and I would have been there with a camera. Wow. Uh, it's, but otherwise, it's exactly the same. Yeah. You know, that, that, that solidarity and camaraderie you have with the with the guys on your shoulder. I mean, you know, of the, just because you're there with a camera, it's no different. Uh, you know, in fact, it's, you could argue it's even stronger because they're the, without those guys there, you're, you're very dead because you've got no way to defend yourself. Um, and everything else in between the trauma, you know, the, the pain, the, the highs, the lows, the, yeah, the whole, the whole shebang, you know? So I, I think, you know, I, I took away from those 20 years of crazy stuff. Um, experiences and knowledge and ability to relate and that's what i try and rely on you know and bring to the pages if that makes sense that's incredible yeah being able to speak the same language adds uh and it, with someone you don't know uh and like an instant credibility because it says oh i he's been there he's done that he didn't just read it somewhere else or see it in a movie and that's readily apparent uh, a lot of the time and helps with that that connection uh with people yeah. when you're doing those kind of interviews for a book and like this right here this stack this isn't even half your books like, uh, I'll talk about that later, but you're, I mean, if I had all of them, they would be uh, yeah, tri triple uh, the, the height of the, the, the stack right here. Um, but yeah, going back to that, there's one thing that I, I think about when you mentioned how it feels after, um, and I don't really, I, I didn't really think about this until just now. I haven't thought about it in years because when I tap into the feelings and emotions behind certain events downrange, I'm usually thinking about that event itself. And then I'm taking those emotions and applying them to a completely fictional narrative in my case. Um, so if I, if my character gets ambushed in Los Angeles, well, I think back what it was like to be ambushed in Baghdad and I take those feelings yeah. and emotions and I apply them to this fictional narrative. But when you mentioned what it feels like after, I haven't thought about that in the longest time. And in that particular uh, instance, we were ambushed in, in Baghdad in 2006. Uh, we were in vehicles and uh, had to stop and, and got ambushed. And we got, when we got back from that and it was a big firefight and whole thing. And we got back from that. And now I remember I'm smiling right now because we had one, two guys shot, but we're okay. Like one was a ricochet and one was, you know, one guy got shot in the, in the butt. It was like more funny than anything else. Like he was totally fine. Um, and, uh, we got back and everyone was so elated. And I remember exactly where we went, exactly the house that we were in, where we were staying, uh, all is still in our gear in the hallways of this place that we were staying. And I remember now I'm remembering that feeling like afterward and oh, yeah. like lying on the floor with like a big smile on their face, just like oh, yeah. arms spread out like this hugs all around. Like it was, it, yeah, that was a cool, that was a cool feeling, but I hadn't thought about that in years. <laughs> so you just mentioned it right now. I, I've thought about the ambush a lot, but haven't thought about what it was like when we got back to base and we're in our little house that we had yeah. there. Um, but that was, yeah, it's a really cool feeling. I'm going to have to incorporate that into the next one. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, what was the, um, was, was there a specific in injury that happened to your back that forced you to have to do that surgery? Or was it, uh, some sort of an overuse type of a thing or what, what happened? Uh, they, they, they don't know. I oh, mean, wow. uh, I had invasive surgery, but, yeah. you know, um, they don't know the cause. Um, it, you know, uh, camera work is extremely physically. Um, I'll give you, an, give you again a brilliant example. <laughs> You'll really relate to this. So when we're in Burma on that mission that I described that first mission, right? I, so I was using, believe, and this is the truth, sealed lead acid batteries that's what was powering my camera so i had right a set of military webbing uh -huh. but rather than carrying grenades or anything it was carrying sealed lead acid batteries right wow. and i had a lead from there to my camera okay uh -huh. and there was a guy there really lovely guy got with him really well a burmese guy a karen guy who was an, uh, an m203 a grenade launcher yep. operator 
and he had a a, a webbing tunic with all his M two or three grenades in it. Uh-huh. And one day we sit down having a laugh. I said, "I bet you my webbing weighs more than yours." He said, "No way," because he had like I don't know two dozen M two or three <laughs> grenades in us. I said, "Anything you want." I said, "So we had this bet, and we exchanged, um, uh, uh, you know, webbing, and mine was." you know, kilos more heavy oh, yeah. this because it was, <laughs> and, and I remember, I remember on that trip also, because you've got that on, you've got your camera on, okay, the camera has a, has a kind of a strut, like a brace that you then, it's strapped around you, uh-huh. and then I had a massive backpack on full of all our gear, you know, camera gear, sleeping gear, food, all the rest of it, and I remember crossing a river in the jungle, a really fast flowing river, and going down. Have you ever oh. done that oh, when your yes. boots go out from under you? Well, I was, and yeah, and 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 the guy, the guy behind me, who was our translator, a, a Karen guy, grabbed my rucksack because I was gone, man. And not only was I gone, you know what happens? The rucksack flips you over, yeah. Oh. So you're like a turtle on your back, yeah. and you're zooming off down that river, and oh. you can't get up. So, yeah. So back to your question, I, I wow. they. they it, it, I will never know what caused, you know, my, the, the the problem with my back, but it, it was just very, very, uh, yeah. Well, carrying, carrying those serious. batteries around probably sure didn't help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it is a, being a cameraman is an extremely physically challenging um, and mentally challenging job, actually. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. On, on so many levels. Oh yeah. Because the other thing about it is, you know, and I. I I'd, I'd, I'd be interested in, 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 you know, your take on this from, from your perspective, but you, you have to, and it's a terrible thing to say, but it's true. As a, as a war cameraman, you have to dehumanize yourself to such a degree. It's horrific. So I'll just give you a, a, an example. You're in Eth- uh, Eritrea. There's a famine. You know, there's a mother with a child who's dying and a child is three years old and, and as a human being, you should say, "Hey, I'll help. What can I do? Feed, water." As a cameraman, you have to you have to film the child die because that's your job. And you tell yourself, "I'll put it out on the news and on CNN and BBC and all the networks, and we'll change the situation." That's what you tell yourself intellectually, but emotionally, imagine what that does oh, to you geez. as a human being and your soul. And you do that for two decades, and that gets pretty damn dark, I can tell you. So when I said that I woke up after that surgery, it wasn't just I woke yeah. up to the fact that one was going to end up in a bad place, dead or injured. I also woke up to the fact that one was going to end up in a bad place in your head. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we I mean, there, a lot of people talk about, of course, uh, military post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury and all the things that are associated um, law enforcement, uh, same thing. First responders, firefighters. Um, very few people really talk about uh, uh, reporters, journalists, cameramen that are out there seeing these horrible things, oftentimes next to IEDs, next to explosions, also at the same time dealing with traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress of watching women and children die. Um, yeah. It's, uh, it's got to be tough. So tough. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a real I – mean, that, that's really very, very, very real. I yeah. mean, you know um, – yeah, it, it, it's something that isn't spoken about a lot, but that experience, especially when you, you know, when you're a, a, a reporter using yeah. a camera and you have to subvert normal human reactions, right? Not good. So, so yeah, um, it, it puts you in a very strange place, and it's not particularly healthy. Yeah, no, I understand. I definitely understand. Um, so that twenty years, and then that surgery, and coming out of surgery, and that recovery led to. A book called Slave, which became a movie and a uh, and a play, uh, also. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So that so when you saw that happening, um, at what point did you say, "Oh, you know what? I can I can make a go at this," or "Hey, I really like this, and I can make a go at this." Like, what 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 was that process? What was that transition like from leaving that hospital bed, leaving the recovery uh, year of recovery, writing Slave, and then moving into this next chapter in life? What was that like? Do you know, I, I, you tell me, okay, do you see yourself as a great writer? I aspire to be the best writer I can be and always improve. Um, there you go. So that's, there you go. Yeah. Do, do you think you'll ever reach the stage where you go, I'm about as good as it gets? 
Uh, I don't know. I've heard directors talk about that. I've heard Quentin Tarantino talk about how people don't get better uh, in uh, in Hollywood with age. Uh, that's why he's only going to do one or two more movies or whatever that is. Um, so I've heard him talk about that. Uh, and then I look at long running series, of course, because I'm a student of the genre. Uh, yeah. Do those characters and storylines improve over time or they're four that are kind of mediocre and then a spike of a good one and then back to some mediocre ones yeah. and like that sort of a thing. So I'm always studying. Um, and, uh, like book sales tell a, tell a story as well. People are, are continuing to come for that character and want to be along for that journey and are still enjoying mm. that ride. Um, so there's a lot of factors in there, but, uh, I don't think you ever get to a peak where you, if, if you ever get to a place, I think where you're like, Hey, I'm a great X, Y, or Z. Um, well, <laughs> Probably you're not. I think you've lost it. Yeah, you've lost it. Exactly. You've lost it. You've, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you've so, lost so that hunger to get answer, better and improve. In answer to your question, you could, you know, triple that pile. And then there's the books I've ghost wrote for various largely military people around mm. the world. But I don't see myself as being a great writer now. I mean, I get told that by people, but you know, um, I am I am amazed literally that every book I write when it turns out good. And I don't know about you, but I'm just starting work on a new book at the moment. I hit 20,000 20, words today, okay? Nice. So so I'm in. Yeah, right? I'm in. exactly. Yeah. And every single time when I sit down with that first blank piece of paper, there's that voice in my head saying, can you really do this? Yeah. I mean, you must have that, surely. I think everybody yeah? has that. Or it's like, okay, here we go. And you're thinking yeah. all the other things in life that could derail this project. And then yeah. if there's are people going to like this or what if they don't after yeah. I spend a year of my life in doing yeah. it? Uh, yeah. But it's so, interesting so, that you so, mentioned 20,000 words because, you know, 10, okay. Uh, 20 is where I say same thing. I'm like, okay, I, I've got this 20,000 yeah. words. I'm good. And then I hit 30 and it's like, okay. And you're feeling better. And then it's like yeah. 60. Then it, for me, it takes another jump. I'm like, okay, 60, boom. Uh, and uh, so I saw, so, but 20 is a good marker. Like I, I, I feel like, okay, I've got to 20. This is on yeah. its on its way. I'm in this. Yeah, I feel good. And uh, yeah. you know, how do I just keep improving and making this better for a better experience for that reader? Um, but that's funny that you mentioned 20,000. Cause that's one that I kind of look at as uh, kind of being a marker as uh, yeah. I've got it. I've got this. Yeah. That's the snowball starting to roll down the hill, you know. Interesting, yeah. But it's interesting yeah, that we had yeah. that same that same number there. Um, and did you did you like the experience of writing Slave? Were you uh, uh, or was it a slog? I mean, your first one. Were you or were you like, hey, this is something I really love? Do, do you know? Um, so so Slave is set in the Sudan. It's set in the Nuba Mountains, which is this incredibly beautiful, um, unbelievably war torn. Um, part of 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 contested um terrain in what was the center of of, of sudan for it was split to two countries yeah. and i had been there i know a dozen times and every time that, you, that i used to go there it's different now because it's been split into two countries but one would have to fly in seven hour flight on a tiny cessna aircraft illegally at risk of being shot down and land on a little dirt airstrip um having left the the actual official correspondent back at you know the 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 the, the, the landing strip yeah. and so because i'd been there so many times and imbibed that culture as much as anything else because the new have the new but you know that they migrated from what was originally um ancient egypt so they're a culture that's 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 millennia old and having been there and imbibed that and seen it and witnessed it um uh, you know, the book kind of wrote itself. Um, okay, it's one person's story. Um, but, you know, I was steeped in all of that reality. So it, it was, it, 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 yeah, it kind of, you know, with that expression, the book wrote itself, you must have times when that happens, you know, um, and it's a beauty when it does. And that, that book slave did write itself. Um, I, I, it just kind of like came out stream of consciousness just wow. on the page. Um, so yeah i mean i found it bizarrely and surprisingly um enjoyable and uh addictive and i wasn't expecting that at all i had never had any desire to write people used to say to me because i used to write my own um documentary scripts they used mm -hmm. to say you know one one producer in particular um a very good friend of mine called julie davis big shout out to julie we still do things together to this day nice. she always said to me you need to write i mean you can just write and i was like yeah no i'm i'm a, you know i go out and film stuff in bad parts of the world and so yeah writing slave was like i guess the watershed moment where i thought yeah one has the ability to string 
a few words together and take people to a place. Hey, listen, I'll tell you a true story. This is mind blowing. OK, this happened over the last two or three days. Get this. Sorry, can I just grab the book? Yes. Let me just, let me just grab the book. Yes, one second. One second. Yes, do it. So this book, right, I'll just hold it up if you can see yeah. it, oh, SAS a... Great Escapes. Oh, yeah, I've got it right here. It's, it's okay. called Churchill's Great Escapes in the States, right? Let me tell you the story because this will blow your mind. Three days ago, okay, oh, an email, that's the one. Three days ago, an email drops into my inbox via my website. The title is Your Book Saved My Life. Hmm. I opened it. This is the story. Guy who's a teacher, but an avid outdoor pursuits um, enthusiast, goes trekking in Eastern Europe, learns from a fisherman. There's an amazing cave system, very remote, treks into the cave system, goes down into it, long way down, finds this amazing underground river, blown away, has a great time down there, walks back up the tunnel. It's a dead end. Oh. He realizes there are more than one way out of the cave system, yeah. goes back to the river, tries the next tunnel, not panicking at all, walks up it until it gets so thin he can no longer crawl along it. Oh my. It's another blind. By now, he's panicking, yeah. walks down that tunnel and realizes he's, he's only got his phone as a torch, oh. realizes there are any number of exits from this river system. Oh. And by now, he's absolutely terrified. And he looks in his bag, right? What he's got is he's got his phone. He's got some chocolate. He's got a water bottle and SAS Great Escapes. No way. No, seriously. So what he does is he gets the book and he rips a page out and he puts it a page at the entrance to the two tunnels that he's already gone up, right, to mark them because mm -hmm. you can see it in, in the light from his phone that he's been up there. The next tunnel he goes up, he rips pages out all the way and uses them like a trail, like, like you know, uh -huh. um, breadcrumbs, the, the, the bowl yeah. in the labyrinth, okay? He does that until he's gone through two thirds of the book, okay, up all these tunnels. And at one stage, he falls twelve feet down a crevasse and smashes himself up. Oh. He's in a really, he's in a really bad way. And then he he sits down and because he, and, and he's read, I'm two thirds of the book by then. He sits down and he says, says I can't give up because those guys in that book they faced far far worse than I'm ever facing here. Yeah. And it was his inspiration. So then. Eventually, do, you, by that system, ripping the pages out, he finds his way out to the light. Amazing. And he gets out alive. Incredible. True story. That's crazy. I, That's another book uh, right there. That's a movie. That's a great movie arrived, right there. Arrived, arrived in my inbox uh, two days ago. That he is said, crazy. I haven't shared this with anyone because I'm still so traumatized. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's crazy. Wow. <laughs> Man, he deserves a signed book for sure. Man. But that's, that's what I said. I've got his address. I'm sending yeah, yeah. him one. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> that's fantastic. Oh, my gosh. Amazing. Yeah, that sounds – just hearing that story makes me – he, You know, he yeah. sent me a photograph of, the, of the, what remains of the book. Nice. And so it's like – it's like a quarter of it left <laughs> with all these pages. And they're not, they're not ripped out neatly. You uh, can tell they're crazily ripped out. Yeah. Covered in mud, cave, wow. cave droppings, the works. Yeah. I, I just – Wow. It, that's amazing. That's amazing. Well, oftentimes when things are tough or, you know, SEAL training in particular, I would think of when people are quitting in droves during Hell Week, during BUDS, our SEAL training, I would think about how much harder it was for guys to cross the beach at uh, beaches at Normandy, running into yeah. uh, uh, elevated machine gun positions, no cover, no concealment, uh, Iwo Jima. I would think about all these things that have been done throughout history that were so much harder than getting yelled at in uh, sunny Southern California on the beach, doing some push-ups yeah. and sit-ups and runs and swims and that sort of a thing. And it really just put things in perspective, uh, which is why one of the reasons I think it's so important for uh, kids. And when I say kids, probably that's uh, middle school age. So that uh, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, and then high school, obviously, to go into the pages of books like these, into the pages of history, um, because they can learn, one, they can learn so much from it, but it also puts things in perspective, uh, especially in a day of social media where they're getting all these bombardments all the time. And it's a little more stressful, I think, uh, for them than it was for for previous generations when it comes to that kind of a, a stress. Um, but uh, but going into the pages of these books, yours in particular, so valuable for anyone, but in particular uh, kids, because it'll save them a lot of heartache 
I was having this conversation with our 12 year old last night at the dinner table, actually, about how the importance of studying history. Uh, and he was asking why it's important. And so I was going into all, all of this actually with him uh, last night. Um, but I got my eye on the clock, so I know we have a we have a little bit more time. But I want to get to the new book, uh, the one that's out now, the one that is coming out, uh, and also the next one. So, how did you make that transition from slave um, into? You've written a lot of books on World War II and SAS and special operations. Um, how did you make that transition to? Was was it uh, Operation Certain Death, which is yeah. an incredible operation that most people yeah. aren't really aware of that happened in 2000. I think your book came out in 2004. Um, yeah. But uh, was that, how did that transition happen from writing Slave to writing, yeah. I mean, it's, and you haven't written only on World War II and SAS and Special Operations. You've written a ton of things, but uh, but you have written a lot in that space. Um, yeah. What was that like? What was that, uh, how did that come about? So at its simplest, I was in a I was in a war zone um, filming, and I had a um, a security guy stroke cameraman because a lot of you 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 guys SEALs, Delta Force, SAS, whatever it might be, you transition into the media after mm -hmm. because doing what you did as elite soldiers is so similar to being a cameraman on on the front line of war. You, you understand that. So this guy was a former SAS guy. In fact, he was a former. New Zealand SAS guy, cool. lovely bloke, still my friend, Mike, big shout out to you. One of the nicest guys I know. Um, hard as anything, but such a fantastic guy. Anyway, so he's there, he's, he's partly doing security, but he's also filming for me. And we sit, we're sitting around the campfire in the middle of the bush in Africa one night, and he says, I'm going to tell you a story. And he told me the story of Operation Certain Death. Well, Jeez. Operation Barris, as it was called, okay. it was the hostage rescue mission by the SAS in yeah. Sierra Leone. And I was like, really? Why don't we know about this? Well, he, he, he said, well, I guess it's, you know, um, special forces operations, you know, I mean, but he said, the thing is, I don't just know the guys are on the mission. He said, I know the hostages. So the, the hostages that were rescued, he also yeah. knew them as well. He said, do you want to meet them? And I was like, yeah. So he put me in touch with, you know, some of the guys, some of the former special air service guys who were on the mission and some of the hostages themselves. And I, I just listened to the story and said, Okay, well, it's not kind of what I normally do, but yeah. this has to be told because this is the most extraordinarily brave and principled operation that I've ever heard of. Because these wow. guys went in to the hell of Sierra Leone, you know, where, you know, the rebels and, and they, they were bad guys. They were not freedom fighters. They were the reverse. And they had this yeah. thing about chopping men, women and children's arm off, long sleeve, short sleeve style to spread terror. They were a credo, a horrific um you know, cult of fear and terror. And they went into that situation because they they kidnapped these these British soldiers and they they rescued them from from impossible odds. So that was the story. And you know, um yeah, wrote it, um, got it cleared via the British Ministry of Defence and got a really nice letter from the rear admiral at the time who was in charge of clearance. And he basically said, words to the effect, dear Damien, um now, I know you probably have spoken to people that perhaps, in theory, you shouldn't have spoken to. But you know something? <laughs> I'm damn glad you have. Because this story <laughs> needed to be told, and I don't think there was anyone better to tell it. Oh, it's fantastic. So, you know, uh, it was a really, yeah, fabulous experience all around. And, you know, um, I know from the guys who were on the mission and and, and the hostages who were rescued yeah. that, that they, they wanted that story out there. Because sometimes, you know, you just want these incredible... Um, you know, missions to be recognized, just yeah. recognized. That's all, you know, the fact you were there and this yeah. happened and that, and, and people died to enable those thoughts. You know, some of our guys were killed, some were wounded to, some of them got really badly traumatized on that operation. They just it, it, often those guys deserve that story to be told. So that was the start of becoming a little bit of a voice for that community. Mm -hmm. um, I just had a message from the, the British uh, politician MP, who uh, um, was uh, uh, one of the uh, ministers for veterans affairs here, and mm. he just messaged me and said, "You know, you are you're a standout voice for that community and for the people in that community who matter. They they recognise what you do." So, and as I said to you, Jack, one couldn't do it, in my view, if you hadn't been there yeah. in same similar situations, just with a camera, not, not, not a weapon. It's just, you know, you've got to have that shared experience in my view. You really have. Yeah. And, you know, I think also it's not just that community, but it's an inspiration to the next generation 
And uh, today, where there's so many of these negative inputs that uh, that kids have, they need heroes today. And they pick up yeah. uh, a book like that, operates in certain death, and they see these people putting their lives on the line for others that they don't even know um, to help those who can't help themselves, being selfless, sacrificing, uh, dedicating themselves to a higher cause, all these things. And it's inspirational to that next generation. Absolutely. And it might be I just mean, that one book that inspires that kid, not just to join the military, but to to rise above whatever adversity that he or she is facing, uh, or to have some respect for the yeah. history of everything that has come before that have given them the opportunity yeah. to make choices in their their own lives. And uh, and in your case, a lot of times to not be speaking German. Um, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. In, yeah. Do, do you know the number of times I get parents or grandparents or even the kids themselves email me and say, you know, your book, your book changed my son Johnny's life. Mm. He was going right off the rails. He read your book. He's yeah. now, you know, he's now in in the combined cadet force. He's going to join the military, and it's turned him around. You know, um, and and that, that's there's nothing better than that. There is nothing better than that. It, you know, that 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 means that you you've done something which is worthwhile. It's not just yeah. a book. It's not just a story. No. And like you say, you know, we we've got to keep this history alive. Mm -hmm. You know. You're writing about World War II. You're writing about the greatest battle for freedom ever fought in the history of mankind, in my view. You know, more people died than any other conflict. And it was so very nearly lost. And, and, and that battle's still being fought today. We still need to fight that battle today. We still need to be ready to defend our freedoms, which we cherish. It's absolutely vital. That's why history matters. That's why the history of World War II matters. That's why the stories of these guys, so many of whom... The majority of them, they weren't professional soldiers. Yeah. They were actors, writers, miners, criminals, thieves, <laughs> uh, lords from, yeah. you know, from... from they Quite were, a cast of characters. <laughs> cast of characters. And, and they came together to fight in freedom's cause. And we have to be ready to do that to this day. Yeah, no, exactly. And uh, in, that, in, in speaking of Sierra Leone, that group that you're, you're referring to, I think they had uh, some sort of a, it was a motto or a credo, and it was... Um, uh, how does the grass grow? Blood, blood, blood. Yeah. What makes the grass grow yeah. was the question. Blood, blood, blood. There it is. Uh, and one of the, I wanted to ask you, I, I think I have it here. If not, I left it upstairs. Um, I might have left that up. Oh, here it is. This one right here. Um, I wanted to ask you, you, the research that you do for these and the things that you have looked into that no one's looked into, to include your latest book, which I want to ask you about, uh, a treasure trove of information that people have not looked at before, or if they knew about it, uh, it didn't register. And in this case, um, that was something that, that 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 happened to me. I feel fairly well versed in history. I'm always trying to learn, always reading everything I possibly can, uh, specifically about warfare and terrorism, insurgencies and counterinsurgencies. Um, but you read Hitler's will, and I didn't know. <laughs> That he even yeah. had a will, or if I did, yeah. it didn't register that uh, yeah. that he had one. If I've ever read that before, um, but what did that feel like to read that will? You know, so I've got a specialist researcher in the states, one in uh, Germany, one in France, and one in the UK. And mm -hmm. my one in the UK said, um, "Just sent me an email." He's got such a dry British sense of humor. He said, "I, I I've learned that Hitler's will." is held at the National Archives in London. Would you be interested in reading it? <laughs> That's all. And I was like, Simon, come on, of course I would. So you had to go into a special room, get permission, and be invigilated, watched over, uh -huh. whilst they got the will out for you. There, there are just a few you know, copies of the original will, and, and, and there's one in. And it was the, yeah, the weirdest, most uncanny experience. The reason being that, well, I mean, Apart from anything else, who would ever imagine that Hitler would have made a will? Right. I didn't... I mean, it's just it's just preposterous. How and why did he make one? I mean, you know, the, the guy committed suicide in a bunker in Berlin, so we're led to believe. You know, he, to the end, he believed the Third Reich was going to be victorious. When did he think about making a will? It's not really a will, because after looting, you know, Western Europe and most of the world of its gold, its artwork, you know, its... It's foreign. It, it, it's currency reserves. Hitler actually had nothing left to give away at the end. It's more what he's bequeathing is his political statement, mm. his continuing belief in his his twisted ideals, you know. And so even in that will, he's still trying to espouse the same Nazi hatred and prejudice. And it, it, to see and to read and to feel 
that document which proved that whenever he wrote it and however close he was to death, he went to his grave without the slightest regret, not even the slight, not even a recognition that maybe he'd got it wrong. It, that was pretty, pretty vile, pretty uncanny. Um, yeah, um, uh, you know, dark moment. And it, and I mention it in that book, um, Hunting Hitler's Nukes, because it's a book about the, the, the program by British and American and Norwegian um, special forces, mm-hmm. basically, to stop Hitler getting a nuclear weapon. Let me tell you how 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 real this was, Jack. So in in the archives there are held German documents about the V2, the the the, the you know the, the first uh, intercontinental ballistic missile yeah. for want of a better description. Uh, this massive rocket that they started lobbing into London. In those plans there are plans for fitting it with a either a nuclear device or a radiological weapon. They actually exist. That's how concretely Nazi Germany was planning, envisaging, using, fitting a nuclear warhead or a radiological device to the V2. So if they'd got to the stage where they could have, where they had enough nuclear material to do so, they had the plans in place to fit them, it would have been the first nuclear missile of the, the modern age um you know so those sacrifices made by those guys in, in that book and those sacrifices are legion as is their incredible determination to survive and overcome yeah that's a signal lesson to the world you know um you know as i said freedom must be fought for every day those guys fought for freedom over months and months and months surviving in the hellish conditions of the norwegian arctic and 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 they pulled off their mission impossible they they torpedoed hitler's nuclear program amazing I mean, it's such a great such a great story um and i have 15 minutes left here so i want to talk about this also um uh, right yeah. here the flame of resistance uh josephine baker's story and you know i've heard her name before but thank you for writing this i mean this is incredible what an amazing story an amazing person um and the way that you got to this one is uh is interesting as as well did uh like your, your family bought some sort of a chateau somewhere that was close <laughs> yeah. to some place that that uh, they had used as a headquarters down so what was the story behind uh behind writing this yeah so in the states it's called agent josephine i much prefer the american cover to be frank with you oh, but, yeah? but but um and it's called the flame of resistance in the uk but yeah, so you know, I mentioned my dad's thatched cottage that we grew up in as kids. Mm-hmm. Well, when we'd all left home, he sold it, and for the proceeds that he got from smelling our, our relatively modest home in 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 the UK, he bought a 14th century chateau in France, which had cattle living in it at the time, complete derelict. And he moved there, and he spent the next 20 years renovating it, and now it is absolutely pucker and amazing beyond wow. belief, and it is the real deal it has you know the pointy towers and the the lovely stone staircases and it's actually got um stones from a former castle that was also reused from which the crusaders rode out on the crusades that's how steeped in history is anyway um about a few years back you know because obviously having renovated this chateau he's he and my stepmother leslie are massively into um in ancient buildings, and they went to visit Chateau des Milons, which is in um, the Dordogne area of France, beautiful area of France. Chateau des Milons, absolute must visit. It, it's 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 amazing. It's a it's a it's a living history to World War Two and Josephine Baker's memory. Anyway, they went there to, to visit the chateau, not really knowing anything about Josephine, and certainly not about her war years. And then afterwards, my dad phoned me up and said, "Just seen this most amazing place," and he told me about it. He said, "You know, this is the chateau that Josephine Baker." the most famous woman before the war, the most photographed woman before the war, this celebrated dancer, singer, movie star. This is where she retreated to once Paris fell and from where she organized her resistance network in France, but also this incredible career throughout the war of espionage, spying for the allies. I'm saying, you're kidding me, come on. You know, how could someone of such stratospheric profile, she was, you could argue the world's first real superstar you know she was she was so well known so instantly recognizable so celebrated how could she have served 
as an agent of the shadows. He said, well, go pay a visit because they have a whole wing of the chateau, which is now the Josephine Baker War wow. War and Resistance Room. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I went and visited and, 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 and saw it for myself. And that was, in a sense, the start of the journey into her story. Um, and I guess what what really grabbed me about it was obviously Josephine was was American of birth, and she'd left the States at nineteen, gone to Paris, made her mm-hmm. her name, fame, and fortune in Europe, and then of course she'd seen, witnessed the rise of the power of Nazi Germany, and realised it threatened everything that she held dear, all the freedoms, all all she'd been allowed to achieve um, in in France and Europe and, and the wider world. And so she decided to stand and fight. But, you know, Josephine, she didn't have to. She was an American citizen. She could have mm-hmm. fled to the States like most Americans did with respect. Citizens of a neutral nation. Mm-hmm. When France was invaded and fell to Nazi Germany, most Americans went to the American embassy in Paris. And why not? And got their, their passport stamped and, and caught a line at home. Josephine chose to stand and fight. And that made me think, you know, what standout courage? And actually, it made me think, well, you know, what would I have done? Could I have done the same? And then the more I, I, I delved into and researched the story, the more I started to realize that she was actually a spy and a standout spy, securing war winning intelligence, but not just for the French, increasingly for the British and then the Americans. She was a standout spy for all those nations who fought in the Allied cause and, and, and bought freedom, you know, um, at great cost to the world. And so, that's why the story grabbed me. It was kind of this this journey over over it's been a decade long journey from first discovering it to writing about it and, and getting it published and you know realizing the book. And I didn't know actually if one could do it because you know the nonfiction you need to be able to substantiate the story. And all credit to the French government. About two years ago, they released a load of their secret service files from the Second World War. The British never do this. The British Secret Intelligence Service, no files ever get released or will ever be released. The French did it with their World War II files, and they released Josephine's files and also the files of her colleagues in the French intelligence service, a guy called Captain Jacques Abte and Colonel Paul Pellol, who worked alongside her, her absolute brothers in arms. And those files made the story tellable because those files proved you know, what she did, who she worked alongside with, and who, crucially, she served for. Incredible. And uh, there's somebody else in there, MI6 spy master, Commander Dunderdale, colleague <laughs> of Ian Fleming, uh, of James Bond yeah. fame, of course. Uh, yeah. I mean, what a cast of characters. Yeah, man. I mean, Dunderdale. So <laughs> Dunderdale, he was the standout spy master for MI6, the British Secret Intelligence Service. And prior to the war, he was their spy master in Paris, working very closely with French intelligence. That's how he got to meet Josephine, who, by the way, was recruited as a spy before the war broke out. And and Dunderdale, to this day, he is such a iconic figure within the British Secret Intelligence Service that in the at the at the training base for the British Secret Intelligence Service in the UK, there is a mess, obviously. And in the mess there is a large, long wooden table. And in the center of the wooden table is a silver bowl engraved with Dunderdale's name and all his all his honors and decorations because he is seen as being the spy to inspire new recruits Mm. and during before and during the war he kind of worked alongside uh ian fleming who was a spy for the admiralty for the british navy um and they were became close friends during the war and after the war and so fleming who wrote the james bond novels based the james bond character in part upon Dunderdale. And you can see how he did so. So Dunderdale was suave, debonair. He was of independent means, born to a wealthy family, so dressed very well, always had the finest champagne, gold Cartier cufflinks, long cigarette holder, just like James mm-hmm. Bond. And But beneath that, beneath that kind of sophisticated air, just like Bond. So Dunderdale's nickname was Biffy. Now, it seems like a silly nickname. It's not. He was called Biffy because he was fantastic at boxing and he always used to biff people at school and university that's where the nickname came from so beneath that kind of refined gentleman in the air there was this real hard core of steel and you can see it in what dunderdale achieved throughout the war just one story so um when war broke out and poland was invaded the polish were the first to really start to break the german germans 
the Germans Enigma codes, the codes by mm -hmm. which they, they they encrypted all their radio traffic. And they had they had teams uh, breaking those codes, and they'd actually built replica Enigmas. They brought them to Paris once once uh, Poland fell, and then when France was invaded, Dunderdale spirited those Enigma machines to Britain, and that's what kicked off the breaking of the codes in the UK. So this guy was, I mean, he's legendary, but no one's ever heard of him because he was a soldier of the shadows. And, and, and Dunderdale, I know for a fact, went to the grave with his secrets. And it's only because when I was researching that book, and I do not know how he found out, a chap called Paul Biddle, Paul, thank you very much, lives in the States, reached out to me, I can't remember, Twitter, I think it was, and said, Damien, I am the keeper of the Dunderdale family private archive. Would you like to see it? And I was like, uh, Paul, yes. So he sent me it all. And this was like letters from the head of MI6 to Dunderdale and to Dunderdale's wife and Jeez. and all his all his wartime military cover and his yeah. false passports. And I mean, you could you could, you could imagine. So again, serendipity came into play. Began to tell Dunderdale's story as part of Josephine's because so the reason why it's part of Josephine's story is when. France fell, jo uh, Dunderdale became Josephine Baker and Jacques Abte's handler. He was the person who controlled them from London. So being able to tell that story, you know, I was so fortunate. And, you know, um, that's that's the serendipity factor that really comes into play, which is about every book you write, I find. There's always that moment when something happens and you're like, boy, am I so lucky. <laughs> That is incredible. And I know I have five minutes left with you before I have to let you go here. Um, but that kind of... Uh, carries us right into this next one. By the time this podcast drops, it'll be out. SAS Brothers in Arms and uh, Patty Main Diary. What an incredible story behind that treasure trove of uh, of information. And then that led you not just to that that I don't know if it was like a book, a scrapbook, or a singular document. I want to ask you, um, but also all the other things that uh, you were given access to is I mean awards or whatever those things that he's collected over over the years. Um, how did that all come about? Yeah, so Lieutenant Colonel Blair Paddy Main, a uh, Northern Irishman, um, arguably the most decorated British soldier of the Second World War, one of the SAS originals, one of those founders in the North African desert, uh, who went on to command the SAS for most of the war. Absolute towering individual. You could argue the most celebrated warrior, or should be, that the British Isles have ever produced, uh, certainly in mo modern times. Um, Anyhow, his family um, reached out to me probably 10 years ago now, and they'd read one of my books and said, um, look, uh, Colonel Main's story's never really been told. In fact, actually, to be truthful, he's in some quarters, he's been somewhat maligned. You know, that trope, mad, drunken Irishman. It's very easy to roll out, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mad, drunken Irishman. Very easy. Grossly unfair. Um, and so they said, you know, would you come and visit us? Um, at the family home, and we've got all um, Colonel Main's war chests. So what happened was five years of, of, of waging war behind enemy lines, seized countless booty, as he called it, took it all back to Northern Ireland on the back of his jeeps, and secreted it in 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 the main home and hid it there for decades, um, including. So just quick quickly. So right at the end of the war, May 45, they drive into, they fight their way into at great cost into a German town called Schneeren. Mm. And, and when they seize the town, they, they find this massive, massive leather bound book called Das Chronic. And what it was, Hitler gave one of these books to the townsfolk of his favorite people to write down the history of the Fourth Reich inside it. And so the SAS stole it, of course, loaded it onto the Jeep, took it back to Maine's home in Northern Ireland, Mount Pleasant took it apart, took the pages out, and in it bound back into the leather cover the 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 record of the SAS at war in World War II. So all the reports, all the all the photographs, all the newspaper cuttings, anything they could think of went in there. That became the SAS war diary, all kept in Maine's house secretly. And so um Maine's niece said, please, and, and I went over there and never forget the day, walked into her living room, and there was this massive wooden war chest with his name on the front of it, that he'd bought back from continental Europe and North Africa, having waged war there for five years, and countless other memorabilia. I mean, wow. you know, uh, German officers' binoculars, uh, the spoons and the forks with the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force stamp on them, wow. that Maine had grabbed 
as he shot up a German officer's mess full of pilots, because killing pilots is far more effective than blowing up their warplanes. Wow. It takes much longer to train an, a German, an enemy pilot, than it does to build a warplane. So if you can go in and blow up and shoot up, shoot up the officer's mess and kill all the mm. pilots, far more effective than blowing up warplanes. And let's grab a handful of cutlery whilst we're there. All of this <laughs> stuff, and it, you know, it was, well, yeah, speechless. And so Labour of Love, 10 years in the making, um, it's the first of uh, two books, maybe okay. three, about this band of brothers, mm -hmm. these absolute maverick visionaries who found a special forces soldiering. And I, I don't feel worthy to write it. I hope I've done it justice. It's an honor like no other. Um, yeah, it's called SAS Band of Brother, Bro Brothers in Arms. The first one comes out shortly. Um, uh, it's one of those books, let me tell you, that wrote itself. You could not make these characters up. There's an American in there. There are Germans in there, German Jews, who fled Nazi Germany and volunteered to fight in British, British Special Forces. Correct. There are Spanish Civil War veterans. This is a polyglot international force of people who are united by one thing, the need to vanquish the Nazi threat. Absolute magic. Magic. Incredible. Incredible. Well, I know I, I let you go an hour and 15, so we're right there. I'll just tease out, uh, actually, one more thing. Uh, I heard rumors that there may be something in the works uh, about your life. Is there, a, uh, is there something like that out there, possibly? I've got um, someone badgering me about it, yeah. I mean... <laughs> well, I, after people I, I, listen I to this, they'll understand why. <laughs> I, was, I was on a train, and I wrote something, and I called it Gods, because... As a war reporter, that's what you felt like. You felt like a god. You felt like a god because you could change the world with your camera. That's what you thought. I mean, uh, it, it's a really, yeah, an unhealthy obsession, but that's kind of, and I just wrote this on the spur of the moment, and I just showed it to an agent, and he was like, oh, my God. We have to, and I was like, hold on a minute there. <laughs> <laughs> this was just an exercise. Oh, we'll see. Amazing. We'll see, my friend. Amazing. Yeah. Well, it's been so yeah. wonderful to talk to you. I could talk to you for hours, obviously. Yeah. Um, everybody go out there, check out DamianLewis.com. Check out all the books. Get the new one. I cannot wait to get it. Cannot wait to read SAS Brothers in Arms and then the two that are going to follow it. So thank you so much for taking the time today. Sincerely appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we'll yeah. link up in person soon. Yeah, man. That was amazing. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah. Take care. Cheers. Thank you to Navy Federal, presenting sponsor of the Danger Close podcast. I've been a member since 1996, since my first couple months in the military. Thank you guys for being on the journey with me. Navy Federal Credit Union is helping their members save when they purchase new homes. They have loan options and resources to make sure you get a great deal. Now, Navy Federal will contribute $1,000 as a lender credit towards closing costs on your new home. Members also save on their monthly payments since there is no requirement for private mortgage insurance. Plus, Navy Federal offers low rates and fees so you can save even more. Navy Federal mortgage experts can help you choose the best option for you, making the home loan process a smooth experience. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. Our members are the mission. Insured by NCUA, equal housing lender. Qualifying members with purchase mortgage applications after 916-22 may receive up to $1,000 towards actual closing costs applied at closing with no cash back and subject to loan program maximum contribution limits. Terms subject to change. Ask your loan officer for details. Navy Federal. I want to thank my friends at Black Rifle Coffee for sponsoring the Danger Close podcast. I've been a huge fan for the longest time. I drink Black Rifle Coffee every day. And if you keep your eyes peeled, you will notice that perhaps Chris Pratt is wearing a Black Rifle Coffee t-shirt, not unsimilar to this one, in the Amazon series adaptation of The Terminal List. Now you can go to blackriflecoffee.com slash dangerclose and use code dangerclose 20 at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. Black Rifle Coffee, America's Coffee, keep crushing. All right, let's talk about 10,000.cc. So 10,000 
awesome company. If you have tried their interval shorts or their tactical shorts, which these are right here, you know that you are not going back to anything else. These things are awesome. And uh, I got a pair of pants from them recently too. And man, amazing, amazing. Um, I've worn a lot of shorts over the years, obviously being a West Coast SEAL at Team 5 when I started out. So that was kind of the the thing. Um, but I have worn a lot of shorts and these ones hands down the best. I mean, that's just how it goes. Uh, they were tested by over 50 special operations members in their testing phase. So it makes sense that they're awesome, but, uh, definitely try these out. Go to 10,000.cc, uh, follow them on Instagram. Same thing. 10,000.cc on Instagram. Uh, but go to the website, check it out. Super easy to order. Uh, there's not crazy amount of different options. So, uh, and then there's packages on there as well. I mean, they just do a fantastic job in all that they do. Free shipping, free returns, uh, go to 10,000 dot cc slash danger close for 15 percent off your order you will not regret it welcome to the gear highlight portion of the danger close podcast first off badass workbench badass dash workbench.com they built this thing for me they burned the cross tomahawks in drove it out set it up and i'll tell you what this thing is not going anywhere it is awesome so check out what they have going on uh jocko pete roberts out at origin this is their sweatshirt right here be sure and check them out put it origin main in uh your search engine it'll pop right up uh they've got geese going on for the jujitsu practitioners out there jeans boots uh supplements all sorts of things so be sure and check them out kafaru right here just got a 3d archery course put in outside which is epic and right here a little quiver I can grab this. Arrows are going in here. Some water here. Range finder right here. So uh, Kafaro, if you don't know who they are, check them out. I think it's uh, kafaru.net, but uh, just put Kafaru, K-I-F-A-R-U in your search engine. It'll pop right up. Uh, has some great packs um, and uh, a bunch of other stuff on there. So be sure and check those guys out. And look at this right here. Tack. Onic Distillery, double barrel maple bourbon. And this is from Rick Hogg. Look at them. Look at him right there, right on the back. Uh, he was on the podcast not too long ago. And I'm going to read this right here. It says, in this bottle is the product of two American classics, bourbon and maple syrup. We empty our bourbon barrels, then fill them with maple syrup. After a few months, they are, uh, months we empty the bourbon infused syrup and then refill the same barrels with private reserve sweet and floral whiskey. Then becomes our annual limited edition release. Of double barrel maple bourbon uh so this one right here is from from rick and check these guys out right here at t-a-c-o-n-i-c distillery.com rick thanks so much for all you do out there check out warhog tactical and ironclad right here ironclad of course produces this podcast look at that little danger close hat right there ironclad symbol right there cross tomahawks right there awesome and Oh yeah, can't have too many Yeti mugs, of course. And then a Danger Close podcast right here, t-shirt, awesome. Thanks guys, Ironclad for all you do. Certainly could not do any of this without you and it is sincerely appreciated. That's it for today. Take care out there. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. Find out more about Damian Lewis, go to his website, DamianLewis.com, link to the social channels from there, and find out what else he has going on and all the other books he's written. It's all there. My title drop video for the next book, Only the Dead, is out now. You can find that on my YouTube channel. You can find that on the social channels, and Only the Dead is available for pre-order right now. You can follow me on the social channels at Jack Carr USA, officialjackcar.com. That is the website, you can sign up for the newsletter there and also click on shop for the merch. And until next time, take care out there, stay safe, be strong, keep fighting.